Hey everybody, today I wanted to talk to you about the resolution about education in STOA LD this year. Now this resolution actually has a lot of merit to it. It's a debate that's been reflected all throughout the centuries, unlike some of the debates we've had, and it actually points to a really deep discussion about what knowledge is and what we really think about humanity. I want to make sure that before we get into that debate earlier in the year, that we have a firm basis and a solid background about what these topics actually are. Specifically, I hope to do a couple things with this topic lecture. The first is look over the background of these two terms, liberal arts and practical skills. The second is to look at the philosophers who have spoken on this issue, in other words, liberal arts and practical skills compared. And the third thing is look at the metrics that we can use in the real world to actually make arguments about the value of these two ideas. Lastly, we'll be looking at some conclusions about the topic. So first, comparing the two terms. We can call this definitions and background. Now, liberal arts actually is very clearly defined as areas of study, such as history, language, and literature, that are intended to give you general knowledge, rather than to develop a specific skills needed for a profession. Now, liberal arts largely draws its background from Greek, Greece and Rome, from classical liberal arts education. Now, during the time period of Greece and Rome, two main concepts explained education, the trivium and the quadrivium. Now, the trivium literally means the three ways, and it talks about the stages that one goes through when studying, the grammar, logic, and rhetoric stages. It focuses on the verbal skills or the ability to articulate the knowledge that you have. Now, the quadrivium is the four ways, and it looks at other, uh, other subjects that children would have studied, specifically astronomy, math, music, and geometry. And it deals with quantitative skills, in other words, knowledge that you have that you can't necessarily reason to. These are clearly very interrelated topic areas, and it looks a lot at uh, the value of the classics. Now, the job of education under the liberal arts paradigm was to transfer excellence, or arete. The idea was that excellence was learned by imitating the examples, and so classical liberal arts education generally reads a lot of classics and deals with a lot of imitation of those who have been excellent in one form or another. These patterns are provided by the works of Homer, Theognis, and Sophocles in ancient times. Now, I want to look at three practical characteristics of the liberal arts education. First, knowledge is inherently valuable. Even if your children weren't going to be astronomers, they all had to learn astronomy of some sort. Second, subjects are all interrelated. Dr. For, Dr. Christopher Perrin, who wrote an introduction to classical education, writes, quote, Knowledge is more like a web than a trust of drawers. There are no subjects that are unrelated to others. Because of this, children were taught that all of their subjects were kind of intertwined. And third and last, there's a high view of the classics. One of the goals of liberal arts education is to hand down the tradition of Western civilization through the generations. Now, this may become a bit more clear as we compare the liberal arts education to practical skills. Now, there's actually no real definition of practical skills, so I've titled it vocational education. Given that vocational education is actually a term that's very consistency, consistently compared to liberal arts, this makes research a little bit easier. Now, there's three real areas of majors you can get in the United States and really in the rest of the world. Arts, sciences, and applied studies. Arts are very clearly a liberal arts focused education. Sciences are kind of in the middle. They're somewhat knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but also a little bit applied. And applied studies are very clearly on the practical skills level. So when you're talking about practical skills, you're talking about things like finance, business management, information technology or computer science, operations management, utilities, agriculture, things that are generally work that you're learning about so that you can actually do a specific job. Now, as I said, there's no real definition of practical skills. However, academia typically compares liberal arts to vocational education. Vocational education is defined as educational training that provides practical experience in a particular occupational field as agriculture, home economics, or industry. Now, it's probably better that you use vocational education when attempting to actually research this resolution, but given that the resolution does say practical skills, make sure that you're clear about that when you actually are writing your cases. So that's some of the background. Next, I want to look at these two ideas compared. Thankfully, this is not the first time that these two topics have actually been under debate. One of the greatest examples of the clear clash between these two ideas is the debates between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. 
Now, Booker T. Washington is actually a really interesting figure. He lauded something called the Atlanta Compromise. He was actually the last generation of leaders that was born into slavery. He believed it was not time to challenge Jim Crow, quote, Crow laws, and instead advocated something called the Atlanta Compromise. Now, the Atlanta Compromise said that African Americans, after being freed from slavery, should submit to white political rule, but that they would have legal and economic and educational equality. He believed that if African Americans were able to achieve vocational education or advance themselves through education and entrepreneurship, then they would ultimately achieve equality at some point. In other words, trades and skills are the path to equality or economic independence. W.E.B. Dubois had a very different opinion of what ought to be done. Now, he grew up in the white north, and he actually graduated from Harvard. He uh, clearly opposed the Atlanta Compromise and instead led something called the Niagara Movement. Now, the Niagara Movement opposed policies of accommodation and believed that African Americans needed to have complete equality. The way that he believed we could do that is actually part of the academic elite, in other words, liberal arts education would bring about full equality as African Americans excelled in traditional areas of knowledge. The works that were written by those two men are great resources for this resolution. And even just those two men and their ideas are applications that fit perfectly into the realm of debate. But I want to give you guys three more sources. The first is John Dewey. John Dewey firmly believed in the philosophy of pragmatism, and he was a proponent of hands-on learning. He believed in experimental education and doing things with your hands, basically tactile learning. He actually also believed that learning goes both ways, that both teachers would learn from students and vice versa. He disagreed with vocational education, but had an interesting view of how children learn that actually could be taken into account in this resolution. The second person is Charles Prosser. Charles Prosser was instrumental in writing the Smith-Hughes Act, which actually started the United States spending on vocational education. His work and his opinions are also something that could be very easily cited, as well as the Smith-Hughes Act itself and the logic behind passing that. Frederick Douglass was a thinker in the same realm as W.E.B. Du Bois. He believed that education is key to advancement, but he disagreed with the fact that liberal arts was the way to do that. He thought that teaching vocational education would help African Americans climb the ladder from slave to free. Now, I want to actually look at some real-world metrics about how these people's debates and how their opinions work out in the real world. There are three real-world ways to compare the two ideas. These are really just seeds of cases or arguments that you can develop more as the year goes on. I want to look at personal development, real-world implementation, and then how these things have worked out in developing countries. Now, the reason why I added developing countries is because they have really an entirely different realm of debate than the vast majority of other examples you'll see. And there's a lot we can learn from the way developing countries actually implemented these two ideas. So first, personal development. This idea tends to lean very clearly towards liberal arts. In fact, according to Dr. George D. Koo, who's the Chancellor's Professor Emeritus and Director of the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment, writes that liberal arts students are generally more engaged in edu educational practices across the board. The reason why that happens is because liberal arts students are learned to, learn to love knowledge for the sake of knowledge. And because of that, they're more likely to engage individually in actually pursuing that knowledge. Liberal arts also creates flexibility between jobs and along careers. It also is capable of responding to labor changes in the market. Now, liberal arts has come back into fashion after a couple um, decades of disagreement with the basic tenet of it. So this might provide some interesting applications of, say, people in the tech industry who have liberal arts educations and so on and so forth. Implementation. Now, Peter Foster wrote a series of critiques that really explain the problems with implementing vocational education. This idea, once again, leans a little bit more towards liberal arts. For example, trained individuals might not be produced for when there is a demand in the labor market. In other words, they might have the wrong training for where there actually is an opening in a labor market. Skilled personnel might not enter the jobs for which they have been trained, but might choose the job with better opportunities. So in other words, their skills would become irrelevant. In other words, skilled personnel might not be utilized and instead be involved in tasks, tasks not relevant to their training. 
It is frequently evident, for example, that highly trained engineers in some areas are heavily involved in routine administration and paperwork, which could be effectively performed by individuals possessing no professional skills. This is basically the economist way of saying that it's very hard to perfectly implement this idea in the real world. I think this problem is really well summarized by the idea of manpower focusing, which happened in planned economies during mostly the Cold War and a little bit before. It tends to happen about socialistic um, or centralized economies. Now, what the people who tried to plan their manpower focusing actually found out is that it's incredibly inefficient and that the government is actually really bad at understanding and preempting where, where the economy is going to go. That would point towards having liberal arts education or more across-the-board education because at any point, the career that you're involved in and trained for might become irrelevant. The third and last area I want to look at is developing countries, specifically three main studies. Some of these kind of lean each another way, but mostly in developing countries, vocational education actually is found to be entirely important in the way that those countries actually work. Now, in Turkey, there was a study done by the professor of economics at the Middle East Techno Technological University. They found that the percentages of the people working were actually higher at vocational education colleges. In fact, it was the difference between 70 and 78 percent employment for men and 28 and 38 percent employment for women. The wages were also consistently higher over the years for people that were engaged in vocational education. In Israel, a study done by the professor of economics at Bar Ilan University basically said that there's no clear distinction in the Israel economy between vocational education and liberal arts. In other words, it kind of depends what class you come from, where you are from originally, and what your heritage is. And the return on investment really isn't consistent across the board in Israel. That just points to the fact that this is a very complex issue that it's hard to draw a one-size-fits-all solution on. Lastly, in Nigeria, the founder and CEO of the Center for Social Justice and Human Development found that um, it's absolutely fundamental that Nigeria actually develop a vocational education system. Now, in Nigeria, there's a lot of liberal arts education. There's a lot of people that are actually very well educated, but there's no vocational education system. And because of that, there's no medical system, there's no clean drinking water, there's no agriculture or banking systems at all, really. In fact, only 27% of Nigerians have clean drinking water. And the hospitals are generally looked on as the place that you go to die. I think that it's very well phrased um, by the quote from this, this author of the Nigerian study. He writes that, quote, rates and patterns of development and industrial, industrialization are formed by what you focus on in education. Nigeria is a clear picture of what happens when you have a lot of liberal arts education and very little vocational education. Now this points to a couple key conclusions, but I think the biggest one that we can make is that different things really work in different places because of different things. It's very hard to draw a one-size-fits-all solution. If you think you have the answer on this topic, you're probably wrong. But we must ask ourselves, what is the purpose of knowledge? Liberal arts says that the purpose of knowledge is understanding humanity and the human condition. There's an intrinsic value to knowledge. However, practical skills say that it's important because of what you can provide for the society as well as provide for yourself. It's an extrinsic view of knowledge. I think we can conclude, though, that balance is best. For example, in Nigeria, the lack of flexibility, the lack of um, diversification of knowledge led to the downfall of their economy. And, for example, when there's no flexibility in communist economies, you go too far the other way with manpower focusing, the result is just as bad. There really is no one-size-fit-all solution. You're both a little wrong, and both sides are a little right. And this debate is really going to be about what we value as a society and what we need to get to as a society. I think it's a debate that's worth having as long as we have the right background. And don't forget the resources that you have and the philosophers that have gone before. We're not alone having this debate, and it's really important that we capitalize on all of the centuries, on all of the great thinkers that have gone before us. Hope you guys have a good year.